Welcome to everybody watching from your office or your home to the Spectators Alternative Conference. This session, The Green Revolution, How Technological Advancements Can Level Up Britain Sustainably, is kindly sponsored by Drax. The UK, of course, was the first major economy to set a net zero carbon emission target, but our work is certainly cut out for us. 23 million homes are fueled by natural gas and will need upgrading, while nearly 90% of vehicles on UK roads are still powered by petrol and diesel. So reaching net zero is going to require big changes on our part, but we'll also need to sustain our standards of living and our quality of life. Indeed, life needs to get better, not worse, under the new guidance or rules or changes that come into play. And as we make this transition, we also, of course, can never forget that we are recovering from severe economic damage caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has been afflict inflicted upon the whole world. And we have an opportunity in the UK to potentially merge the leveling up agenda with green solutions and the COVID recovery. The government has yet to establish a clear path as to how it will achieve net zero by 2050, but we know that new technology potentially greenhouse gas removal technologies, along with others, will need to play a role in leading the charge to carbon neutrality. So to discuss what is not a small topic, uh, we've brought together a fantastic panel. Will Gardner is the Group Chief Executive Officer for Drax. Andrew Griffith is the Conservative MP and former Business Advisor to the Prime Minister. Dr. Jonathan Marshall is Head of Analysis at Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit. And Emma Pinchbeck is Chief Executive of Energy UK. Fantastic panel, thrilled to have you. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'm going to start by asking each of our panelists to speak for two or three minutes tops, just to give a few opening remarks so we can dive right into questions and conversation. And of course, the most important part is for you, the audience, to have your say as well. So please submit your questions into the little questions box on Spectator TV. Uh, those will be funneled through to me and I'll put your questions to our panel. Um, so Dr. Jonathan Marshall, I'm gonna start with you. Right, thank you. So the overlaps between the government's levelling up agenda and its net zero target have been around for a long time, but now there's a clear potential for tailored economic interventions to link the two as the government looks to reboot the economy. There's also a strong correlation between regions suffering most from COVID-19 economically and in terms of current infection rates and those that can be boosted by delivering on plans to build back better. So there's three parts of the economy that were focused on a recent ECIU report that I'm just going to gloss over the top of. The first of which, in terms of the best bang for buck in, um, in terms of both jobs created and emissions tackled is upgrading Britain's homes. There are millions and millions of properties below the government's intended efficiency target and they're spread all around the country with the leakiest often in areas hardest hit by the pandemic. Cutting energy waste from our homes will make the next step in cleaning up heat, whether through heat pumps or hydrogen easier, as well as boosting millions of trade peoples and small businesses. The Green Homes Grant, as announced in the summer statement, was a start here, but it's not really going to make a dent without turning that into long-term action. Second is renewable energy. Um, it's already revitalizing coastal communities. There's turbine factories, ports, maintenance jobs spread all around, um, especially the east coast of England and Scotland. Um, the offshore wind sector is booming as well and it's set to deliver ever lower costs as technology presses ahead. The UK is also poised to make the most of floating offshore wind, technology with a huge global market as it can be deployed in seas that are too deep for current, um, current technologies. There's also a big potential for onshore wind and solar, both in terms of new capacity and upgrading our oldest wind and solar farms as they come to the end of their lives. In fact, the government-owned renewable energy planning database shows more than 700 projects awaiting construction, again, all around the country. Tied in with the power sector is readying a high-performance electric vehicle charging network. Um, we've already seen the rumours that the, the uh, phase update for sales of petrol and diesel cars could be brought forward to 2030. And this could have been shown to support uh, tens of thousands of permanent jobs installing and maintaining charging points, again, spread all over the country. The appeal of electric vehicles is clear, and it really shouldn't be held back by insufficient infrastructure. Now, until last week, all eyes were on the budget and the comprehensive spending review to outline the next stages of the green recovery. While the delay to these and the sort of downgrading of the CSR to a one-year um, intervention rather than a longer one um, is obviously gives more time to get into the detail, there's still scope for action in the short term. Before the end of this year, the government is expected to release the energy white paper, a building decarbonisation strategy, a transport decarbonisation strategy, and a national infrastructure strategy. Making the right calls in all of these can help to get the UK's green recovery up and running. Thanks so much, Jonathan. I'm going to turn to Will Gardner, Group Chief Executive Officer for Drax. Thank you, Kate. And I want to just maybe I'll, I'll pick up on 
one point that Johnny made, which is about how renewable energy can be a big driver of this both green recovery, um, a bounce back from COVID-19, and enable the UK to be a world leader in some of the next generation technologies that are coming down the pipe. I think as the Prime Minister mentioned last week, he's become an advocate or an evangelist, I think is the word he used, for carbon capture and storage. Uh, and I want to sort of give a few of the details around how I think that can help. Right? So around the UK, different industrial clusters are, have been formed to, to actually work with the government to put in place the infrastructure of carbon capture and storage. And the idea here is that if we capture CO2 coming from mostly industry, um, but also I'll come back to power generation in a second, we can effectively enable you know, parts of the UK, a lot of them in the north, um, to effectively maintain their industrial in infrastructure, their jobs, what they have in place, and sort of allow those to be competitive as we move into a net zero and green economy. So give an example of where Drax is, we are in the Humber. Um, Humber side has you know, you know, significant heavy industry. Um, there are as many as 55,000 heavy jobs, then, jobs now there in heavy industry that we think could be saved or continue in a net zero world if we put the carbon capture and storage infrastructure in place to actually capture the CO2 coming out of those industries and store it under the North Sea. How can Drax contribute to this or what, what is the sort of the special piece that we have? Because again, you mentioned at the beginning the opportunity or the need ultimately for negative emissions technologies if we're going to hit net zero. Um, not only are we going to have to find ways of offsetting some emissions that might be very difficult ultimately to, to effectively get to zero, but actually I think we need to start thinking of, of negative emissions as a way to decarbonize faster, ultimately less expensively or cheaper, and ultimately with less risk. Right? So, Drax Power Station is converted from being probably the largest single source of emissions in the UK to being the largest decarbonization project in Western Europe by using sustainable biomass. If we add carbon capture and storage infrastructure to the power station, we can ultimately be carbon negative, meaning that we'll be taking more CO2 out of the atmosphere than we're actually putting into it. Right? And if we do that, ultimately we think we can do that at a cost of let's say less than 100 pounds a ton of CO2. Uh, which is significantly less expensive than a lot of the other things that still need to be decarbonized. And ultimately, we think that's a great way for, you know, again, the leveling up agenda to continue. We can keep um, significant existing jobs in the north of England. We can also enable other sectors to become part of that. So, for example, the carbon capture and storage infrastructure that would be needed or that would be put in place in the Humber would be a great um, partner for a hydrogen infrastructure. Right? So actually the best, one of the best ways to create hydrogen is by capturing the CO2 um, when you make it. So it's a great partner for other new technologies. And again, that would make the UK a world leader um, in the next generation of green technologies that will enable the whole recovery from C19 and, and uh, position as well for a net zero world. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, going to move to Andrew Griffith, who's a Conservative Member of Parliament and former Chief Business Advisor to Boris Johnson. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Kate, and, uh, and thank you for inviting me to join this panel, because this is such an exciting and important topic. Um, you know, if you think about what we're trying to do, it's incredibly disruptive. You know, we've built an economy based on carbon since we first warmed ourselves as we crawled out of the swamp and grabbed a piece of coal on the seashore to keep ourselves warm at night. And the ambitious and disruptive goal we set ourselves as politicians is over a short number of decades to completely transform the economy, uh, to completely transform every aspect of human life. Uh, and I'm very excited about that. I think this is going to spawn multiple new industries, trillions of dollars of potential revenue, new jobs, new employment, the sort of employment that's likely to be outside the center of our great cities, which is where our economy is too fixated uh, and too centered at the moment. And the UK has taken a lead. I mean, you'd never hear it from the narrative uh, that we hear about the environmental lobby, but the UK is far and away the leader uh, in its ambition and in many of the aspects of this new economy that we're going to build. Uh, and so my point is that it's wonderful that we've got people like Will here and that organizations like Drax, private sector organizations that can mobilize innovation and capital are putting their wheel, their shoulder to the wheel. Uh, because if we're going to have the sort of recovery that we need to have, we need to attract trillions of new investment. And as we know, that can't all come from, from the government balance sheet. The government has a role to play. We should set a clear 
regulatory agenda. And actually, I do think this is a space in which there is more clarity about the destination uh, and, the, and the journey there than there are in, in some other areas. We've got to foster a climate in which people like Will and his contemporaries feel confident that they can invest. And these are long-term bets that people are placing. The outsized opportunity uh, is extremely attractive, but we've got to make sure that the climate is conducive for that uh, in the UK, as we see at the moment. Uh, life is not easy uh, for businesses, uh, but the challenges are about certainty and confidence. They're not, for once, they're not about the access to capital uh, or the price of that capital. So I think any one of the opportunities we talked about, Will's involved in the generation business. There's the whole mobility sector. Uh, and I'm excited, as, as well as electricity, if I can say, um, I think there's a great opportunity potentially in hydrogen. Um, and one of the roles of government shouldn't be to pick individual winners, but again, to be solutions driven. If we've got a clear objective about where we want to be, uh, we can afford actually to encourage and foster some innovation to support some failure along the way in the hope that by doing so, by taking those risks, we maximize the outsized opportunity to create jobs and prosperity and wealth. Because as you know, Katie, goodness knows we're gonna need it. Uh, and so that's what, another reason why this is so important. Lots of optimism from you, Andrew. Something, something refreshing, really, these days. Uh, well, we don't is, get a lot of this that. Is, this is disruptive. This is, what, this is actually what we're good at. I mean, this was the country that led the Industrial Revolution, uh, that conquered the oceans because we were one of the first to master shipbuilding. Uh, and so I definitely see this as an opportunity through that lens. It's not that it's not going to be easy. And it's not that others aren't going to see precisely the same opportunity, uh, which is why we've really got to uh, line ourselves up in a very good way uh, and go after this. Well, Emma Pinchbeck, uh, Chief Executive of Energy UK, uh, do you echo that optimism? Give yeah, actually, opinion. Andrew's really, really helpfully teed me up because the first thing I was going to say is anyone in the audience thinking that this is an environmental revolution should rapidly wrap their brains around the fact it's an industrial one and and the shift we're likely to see is a bit like the move to you know the agrarian age with the invention of the plow and then again the steam age with the invention of the steam engine this is the it's a huge technological shift and the only difference between this and previous economic shifts is that we're having to do it in um the age of the anthropocene where we where we are aware that there are natural limits that that are on their own timetable regardless of how quickly we can get technology to scale and that's the fundamental challenge for governance and for policy and, and indeed businesses is making this industrial revolution happen at the pace required to meet the environmental challenges that are very clear to us now um, but luckily unlike you know 10 years ago when i started working in in energy and in, in the environment we have done it and we know that by investing in low carbon technology there's massive economic payback and people have mentioned offshore wind in the UK, but let's just pick that because it's the, the example probably best known to the audience, where there was a partnership between industry and government. Government helped finance an early stage technology where we could identify that there was massive potential for it in the UK, got it to scale, and um, you know, years earlier than planned, the technology is now our computing fossil fuels. So everywhere you go in the world, you will find a renewables technology, which is now cheaper than the fossil fuel equivalent, including the additional cost of running this of a, a systems because they generate slightly differently like this rather than like this. Um, and including um, everything, everything about the, the upfront needs for investment right the way through to where they are in the system. So they are hugely, hugely cheap. So that's, that's a payback immediately. We have most of the technologies we need, actually. I, I agree that there are some that we need to get to scale, but we know what they are. Um, um, and the last thing, and the thing I want to kind of really emphasize here, is we've become very aware of their co-benefits beyond the, um, the provision of low carbon services, so clean electrons and molecules. So for offshore wind, 90% of the government's investment went to areas outside the southeast of England. Johnny talked about you know, the coastal communities around the UK that have benefited from these technologies because fundamentally in a distributed, decentralised, decarbonised energy system, assets and investment go all around the UK. Um, we're aware of the health benefits because we're much more conscious of things like air quality. Um, there have been uh, 
demonstrator projects where we've used health commissioning budgets to fund upgrades to people's homes or upgrades to boilers because the local health service literally saves money from doing that by improving the housing stock because they get fewer people in with respiratory illnesses like because we've started to do this we are aware that it is very good value for money for government to do it um but there are a few things that i think we need to fix in order to kind of really push decarbonisation to other areas of the economy and, all, and to keep actually ma to maximise those economic benefits to the UK. The first is about the value of things. Everything about kind of the co-benefits, industrial, health, social of doing this are very difficult to capture in the way that we currently evaluate policy. So some kind of net zero test across the entire economy has been floated, something like that would be good. Taking another look at the Treasury's Green Book and how we capture value would be good. So something about do we fully understand the benefit of doing this to the economy? Do we have, a, do we have a, uh, an economic assessment model that's fit for this revolution is a huge question. The second thing is to sort the market design out. We're putting new technologies which are fundamentally different into the system and we are not changing the market mechanisms around those at all. So we can't fully capture their value. If you're Drax and you're offering flexible energy services, you can't tap into the flexible energy markets fully to get the benefit of that because they don't exist and if you're a customer you certainly can't so if you're someone with an electric vehicle plugged into the system you're not going to see the full value of charging it at different times or using it like a battery because we, we don't have the right market design for it we also don't have a decent carbon price um, to reflect the cost of co2 in the economy and we can't free up investment because um our investors can't access the full value of the assets we're putting in the system. So sort the markets out. The third thing is to properly invest in the infrastructure we need, whether that's networks or new technology like CCUS, and to really realize the value of the industrial stuff. So our competitors around the world, alongside investing in the technology markets, do things like invest in keys, Q-U-A-Y, so that they can get big boats to build big wind turbines easily into their ports and we do not do that kind of investment well in the UK and I'd argue we need to um, and relatedly we need to invest in skills and training people up for this revolution for the future you want to be putting boilers into people's homes uh, that are hydrogen boilers possibly or, or better yet heat pumps you need our heating engineers to know how to do that um, and lastly and very quickly as a personal bugbear of mine we're going into people's homes next we're doing transport systems we are going to be changing things that are very personal and visible in people's communities and which have massive impacts and benefits for them in their lives. And we do such a terrible job of telling them that. So the government is very pro the smart meter rollout. We're putting this technology into people's homes. Um, and I haven't heard one government minister talk about having a smart meter installed in their house. And the difference that would make to then being able to do that in everyone else's homes would be massive. And it's so underestimated when we're talking about this big economic shift. So I'd put a punt in for some more time or money being invested in how we talk about this revolution, not just how we execute it. Thank you so much, Emma. There's clearly so much to dig into. We already have some questions coming in. Please remember, if you'd like to submit a question to our panel, you can do so through Spectator TV. That will come straight to me and I will put it to them. But I'm going to abuse my position as chair a little while longer just to ask a few questions. Um, well, I wanted to pick up on something that Andrew spoke about um, and, and the role of private companies uh, in, in the green revolution. The Committee on Climate Change estimates that the total cost of getting to net zero will be roughly 50 billion pounds per year, um, an estimate from the Treasury and the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy a while back put the figure at 70 billion pounds per year or a trillion by 2050. Um, many would say that it's worth the cost, but you still have to find the money and arguably that can't all come from the taxpayer. Some of it is going to have to come, much of it's going to have to come from private companies. Do you think the balance is right so far? And what role do you think companies like Drax and others are going to play in this revolution? No, thanks. So I think that there's a couple of... Um we look backwards, there's a couple of very good examples of the way the government has done um, a great job at incentivizing next generation technologies. I mean, the offshore wind one is a great one, right? I mean, the first CFDs for offshore wind were at 150 pounds a megawatt hour, you know, probably tripled the price of power at the time. And now, as Emma pointed out, 
you know, offshore wind is cheaper than you know the next best source of the next cheapest source of power pretty much everywhere across the UK and in most countries. And so that to me is a, a classic example of how government intervention in a sort of a market that needed support, needed confidence has worked super well, right? The same, I think the same idea works for carbon capture and storage, right? So two things I think the government can do. One is well, what we want to do, which is negative emissions. You know, we need, we need a market where basically that we can get long-term certainty in a price of carbon, right? So actually when we actually reduce carbon, we can get compensated for that, right? If you look at the forecast from Bayes, for example, they're looking at a price of carbon that could be as high as 100 pounds a ton by the end of the 20s, right? We can do this for that price, right? So if you tell me now, we'll give you certainty in that price for the long term, and if, we, if, it, if the price goes higher, happy to share that benefit back. If its price is under that, we need that sort of government support. So there's that government sort of, if government can provide certainty, we, can, we will invest, right? And then we will put, you know, billions, if not more, into this to make that all happen, right? The second thing the government can do is they can put the infrastructure in place, right? And this is what I think is a really interesting example of how infrastructure can enable competition in new industries. So if you put the infrastructure through the Humber to do carbon capture and storage, and then you say to industry there, you can have access to that infrastructure, but you need to compete. So we'll, you know, we'll allow the people that put in the lowest cost bid for decarbonization to have access to that. So the government puts the framework, they put the infrastructure, and then the industry effectively will put the capital to put the projects in place to make it happen. I think that all the, all, and the exciting thing for me about this is all the pieces are in place, right? All the things that we need for next generation carbon capture or for backs to negative emissions are part of the tool, the, uh, the toolkit the government has already used, right? Jonathan, what do you make of that? Offshore wind is often held up as a very good example of where things went right. It's proven to be much more successful than was originally estimated and cheaper as well. Should we be so optimistic to think that will be true for, for all future forms of energy, whether it be carbon capture, nuclear? Is, is the story of offshore wind bound to repeat itself or are we going to struggle a bit more along the way? It's definitely not bound, not, not bound to repeat itself, but you can give it a, a good chance of doing so. Um, as Will said, the, one of the reasons why behind UK offshore wind sector being so successful was really good policy underpinning it. I um, you know, the CFD is a contract for difference that, you know, basically guarantees a price for the amount of ed for energy produced has been a major factor in costs falling and has been copied by other countries around the world as a great piece of policy making. So there's no reason why, you know, without... Where we, unless, no reason why, unless you put like proper thought and proper rationale behind devising these policies, why you can't create real good, real frameworks that other technologies can really thrive in and then be as successful as offshore wind. Andrew, how much can companies plan and have certainty? And we all know that certainty is key. When we haven't heard from government yet what its pathway is to achieving net zero by 2050, the energy white paper has been delayed. Many of its plans around its, 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 its green energy path have been delayed. Understandably so. Don't think anybody questions in the year 2020 why we have had those delays. But still, um, you know, every day we get closer to that target and we have really yet to hear from government how it's going to achieve um, this target that it's, it's put into law. So what do you think we can expect when we finally get the announcements? I, I don't know any more than anyone else. I'm not a member of the government um, about when we expect that. Um, if, if, if I was looking, I think there's a huge wave. So I know because I speak, speak to people in the community, a huge wave of international capital that's looking to be deployed both in this space uh, and in the UK. Uh, and I suspect probably um, as we go through the end of this year and start looking into 2021, which is going to be a banner year for the UK, that that's the time that people will want to move off the sidelines um, and start placing, um, I, I say bets, I don't mean bets, but, but start putting money to, uh, to work behind some of these projects. So if you ask me when would be a perfect time, and I think this will be the case, um, the government to come forward between now and the end of this calendar year, that would enable us to go into 2021 with COP26, our leadership of the G7, um, hopefully coming out the back end of this uh, pandemic, obviously completing things like the spending review, all of those could come together in a really strong sweet spot. Um, and, and that would be what I would hope. That, that would be what I would hope. We may get some, um, some threading of some of the policy areas between now and then. If I, if I can just follow up Will's and Johnny's comments as well. I mean, one of the huge opportunities, it seems to me, is the UK's capital markets. 
I mean, carbon is going to be a tradable commodity. It's possibly going to be the, the tradable commodity of the 21st and 22nd centuries. Um, and one of the things that our capital markets have always been exceptionally good at is trading and pricing and creating markets and legal frameworks and sometimes insurance frameworks in all of these markets. You think about, you know, the, the, the gold market was traded out of London for almost all of its life. Now, you know, with the exception of a, a few esoteric parts of the United Kingdom, without wishing to uh, offend anybody, um, we've never been major in terms of the production of gold, but huge swathes of, of the world's gold was traded through London. Uh, and the same is true of many commodities. So one of the contributions that we're gonna make to this global revolution, I hope, is to create the facility of very deep, very liquid, very expertised capital markets as well. Emma, do you agree with Andrew's bullish timeline that between now and the end of the year would be the time to make some of these announcements? Of course, the chancellor yeah. postponed his budget, not feeling like it was the time or the appropriate time to make some pretty hefty economic decisions. But perhaps there is an argument that uh, much of what we already knew about what has to be done on green energy was before the COVID crisis. So at least something could be put forward before the end of the year. There is no better time for this, um, for, for three different reasons. The first and the kind of most predictably hippie-ish story is, is that we are rapidly running out of time to, to, do the, to do it with the least bad consequences for the way that we all live. That's, that's why people talk about 1.5 or 2 degrees. I mean, just to kind of labour the economic point, bits of California have been on fire for much of the year and they're the fifth largest economy in the world, there, there are huge impacts to this, you know, one, the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees represents a fairly significant amount in terms of um, functioning global economies and, and our global supply chains and parts of the world becoming habitable or not, and I think we always forget that, that there's a kind of economic reason that we're pushing for the environmental timetable we are, so there's that. Um, on the politics, there are so many good opportunities to do this with this, with this government at this time, um, and I'd say especially because of the pandemic, which is that, you know, we've, we've heard the government make a case for investment for a sustainable future growth. And we know now from having done this with several other areas of the economy that an investment in decarbonisation for heat or transport or pushing on with power sector decarbonisation is likely to, to return tenfold in terms of jobs and money back to the UK. Um, and there are lots of policy opportunities to do it. So, you, you know, you mentioned the budget, of, of course, and, and hopefully eventually we'll see something from the Treasury. But the energy white paper is due. The government will have to give its NDC for the negotiations next year. It's a kind of our own um, roadmap to dealing with the Paris Agreement. That's due in December. We've got the sixth carbon budget in December. There are lots and lots of opportunities to say things at the scale required. And on the point about carbon pricing, I agree. And I would say just to be a bit punchy, it, it, that we have the technologies that we need. We've, we've had the advice from the Committee on Climate Change, from the industry, from experts for about a decade now about what needs to be done. And the only thing that changes is the imperative and, and, and our kind of knowledge about the benefits back. Um, we understand it will be a public-private partnership. We literally just need the action from the government. The only thing that is slow now in this transition is, is, is policy you know, that the markets are, are going um, and that I think any of the above would do, you know, a, a whole economy carbon price, if you want to go for a pure markets approach, would be better than what we've got now. An interventionist policy approach that regulates heat would be, would help kickstart the economy, you know, um, offering certainty for investors by continuing mechanisms that just stabilise the investment climate like the CFD, you know, there are we have all the answers to this stuff. The frustration of industry is often that we're just waiting and, and the time is really now for government to do something about it. And that is with the, um, that is with a, a, a career of being largely optimistic about what government can do and feeling as, as someone said that this government has already done more for, for green stuff in the last six months than we've, than we've seen in the last sort of five, 10 years. So, um, it's not meant to sound like sour grapes, it's meant to sound like an industry that really wants to get cracking, just waiting for, for the right policy mechanisms to do it. 
Well, you've made the case for bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. Uh, there's a lot of talk of new technology being necessary to hit the 2050 net zero target. Um, but I think viewers would be interested to know, from your perspective, has the, all the technology been developed that can get us to net zero? Or are we still relying in theory on some more developments that don't quite exist yet? Uh, very good question, Katie. Let me, let me um, talk a little bit about greenhouse gas removal technologies in general. Right? So the idea is, the general idea is, can we take CO2 out of the atmosphere, bury it under the ground and stick it back sort of into the rocks where it, where it belongs? Um, one technology that people are more familiar with is so-called direct air capture, where literally you're running the air though, through a set of screens with giant fans and effectively the, the idea is that it goes through a membrane which can separate out the CO2 and let the rest of the air go through, right? And that does work. There are operating plants that do that, but it is quite expensive, right? It costs about 300 pounds a ton, right? But again, to your point, technology is there, right? Now, BEX, which is effectively bioenergy, as I said, bioenergy plus carbon capture and storage, all of the pieces are there today, right? So we generate power. We generate about 5% of the UK's power every year using biomass at the power station in Yorkshire. So that's the first step in the process. Well proven. We've been doing it for you know, five, 10 years already. And we basically have you know, gone from emitting about 20 million tons of CO2 to effectively now close to zero, not very much. Carbon capture and storage, which is the next step in the process to complete the whole chain, is being done today, right? So for the technology that we would want to use is in place, for example, in the US at a plant called Petronova doing a million tons of carbon capture per year. We're, and that's, that's technology effectively that's uh, delivered by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. We have a trial project or a pilot project that started up last week. We've captured our first ton of CO2 with them already. So that technology is now, we're basically figuring out how we will scale that at the Drax power station. And we think we can be ready to make a full blown investment decision by 2023, as long as the government framework is in place and the infrastructure in is in place, as I mentioned before. So all the pieces are there. Let me, I wanted to, while I have the chance, follow up on Andrew's comment about markets, which I am a, a big fan of as well. And if you think about, see carbon markets. Right now, there's lots of people who have a demand for, for those carbon credits, right? So people who are emitting CO2, they need the credits to offset what they emit, right? There are not very many companies who actually are, have the potential to create credits, effectively to provide a, a supply of credits, right? People who are capturing CO2 and removing it from the atmosphere. See what the economics of that, you know, lots of demand, prices go up, lots of supply, prices go down, right? So fundamentally, if we can actually deliver more greenhouse gas removal technologies, create a market where there's buyers and sellers, we can help bring the cost of decarbonization down. I think that's a key part of our argument. Sorry, Jonathan, do you agree that the technology is there uh, to, to meet the 2050 goals and that we're not relying on anything that has yet to be concocted out of thin air? And also to this point about markets that, that Will and Emma have mentioned now, um, Emma said markets are ready for these changes. They're actually quite excited about them. Is, is, is that true across the board or is that just true for the big players? Are the small to medium sized players perhaps not so ready for this radical change? Um, so in terms of the technology being ready, um, everything that we need to get to our net zero target is, is in place. But saying that there's no harm in taking a punt on something that might come along and make things easier along the way. So, you know, we know, um, we, we know how to decarbonize the power system, for example, we know how to build um, renewables, we know how to build nuclear power stations. But, uh, you know, a few, uh, a, bit, a bit of targeted investment in bioenergy and carbon capture isn't, isn't a bad thing. It's not going to slow anything down. Same with decarbonizing our homes. We know that heat pumps work. We know how to install them and how to use them. But again, you know, taking a, taking a chance on hydrogen boilers, for example, or hybrid boilers that combine both might help further down the line. So while there's arguments for using what we have, there's, you know, investment and research should continue into technologies that, you know, could, could come and, you know, sort of not save the day, but definitely help. Um, you wouldn't have, for example, thought five years ago that, offshore wind would be the, the backbone of the UK's power system. You'd have thought it would be, if, if it was going to be renewables, it would be onshore wind and solar. But it was, um, you know, it was through targeted support and backing an industry where you've seen something that re really, really develop. And on, on the point about markets, um, there's, there's no shortage in, in people calling for this, just to look at the power sector. Um, you know, there's no, 
there's currently a whole host of services provided by big and small players in the power sector which aren't um, aren't reimbursed properly. So this year, the national grid has had a lot of issues, um, not issues, a, a, lear- a learning curve in balancing the grid while we've had lower demand due to factories and places that weren't being closed and a higher proportion of energy coming from renewables, which have a variable output, as Emma said. And, you know, it's managed to come up with services to sort of, you know, create virtual power stations out of car batteries, for example, or to incentivize people to turn on their washing machine later at night, for example. These, these are opportunities that can be open to anyone from, you know, a household with a fridge to um, some big industrial players that have, you know, huge loads on the grid. The, it's, it's getting this framework right and getting this, these opportunities open to everyone um, through their energy suppliers or through government policies that companies di- um, interact with directly, which can really spur things on. Andrew, we've had a question in, um, more or less asking uh, if the government and and the Conservative Party are so committed to the net zero target, why not entertain a a Green New Deal? Uh, Why not uh, bring in a a high paying green jobs program uh, encouraged, indeed mandated by government policy as some on the left, particularly in America, the, the Democratic Party have been advocating for. I mean, what's the line really between government involvement and in your opinion going a step too far? I mean, I think that can be quite semantic in truth. I mean, everyone's got their own little program of, of green initiatives uh, and this government is making very substantial commitments of taxpayers' money to things like the Green Homes Grant, which is a great program and, and it's getting going. Uh, it's obviously got a long way to run. Um, sometimes the, the, the things that hold us back, the inhibitions that the, the, are, are not just you know, the competitive bidding war for how much of the taxpayers' resources the state can spend. There's, there's of course a role for that. The, the state is a big actor in every market. Um, often its role as a procurer itself uh, can be a real boon to markets. That can be a, a, a great progressive way uh, of allowing businesses, sometimes small businesses, which I'm a huge fan of, because they're often the most innovative, uh, that can be a way of small businesses getting to scale uh, and in turn attracting and mobilizing capital themselves. So, I mean, personally, I would hope the government doesn't just decide that its biggest intervention in achieving this incredibly important trans- transformation is getting into a bidding contest about how much state money it can spend. Because mostly because I don't think that will get us to where we need to get to. I do think, you know, some of these are global. Um, We need to mobilize the power of innovation. uh, And you can do that. You can see in the um, the crisis we've just had, um, it's been an incredibly difficult period for lots of different organizations. But I would argue actually the private sector has done a pretty good job. I mean, we've had one or two moments, but then the food supply chains that are entirely in private sector hands have just got on and solved the problem, which is what risk capital does each and every day. Uh, And I'm much more excited, perhaps from a natural philosophical perspective, about being able to create markets, to shape markets. Yes, certainly I take Emma's challenge about, you know, getting on and doing some of this stuff, completely agree with that. Um, But that to me is the more exciting side of the equation. You know, two politicians just bidding bidding to, to spend other people's money without thinking more holistically, I think is less exciting. And we shouldn't forget, as part of this, that we've got to bring the consumers with us as well. Now, I think in some cases, they're there or they're even dragging dragging government a little bit further forward. Um, But there are some other areas where consumers aren't there. Um, And that's where you need political leadership as well, I think, because, you know, there there are challenges and challenges mean there are some trade-offs as well. Um, It's important the economy is in good shape because if you're going to take people on a journey to make some of those difficult trade-offs and decisions, it's clearly as helpful uh, that as many household uh, economics are in as good shape as possible and that we can minimise the scarring effect of the COVID crisis, which I think the government has done uh, a pretty good job on overall. Emma, we have multiple viewers today writing in to ask about different kinds of energy and technology. Uh, Somebody said, what's happened to combine heat and power? You heard a lot of that talk back in the 90s, but now it seems to be 
old news. Another has said a, qu a question from Pete, what about mini nuclear plants as envisioned by Rolls Royce as a power source? I mean, there almost seem to be countless numbers of, of new forms of energy that our viewers will be hearing a lot about. How does one go about um, determining, you know, which is best, which is most efficient, which is cheapest? I mean, is there just a go-to for consumers yeah. to learn more about these kinds of energy and to decide which one they think they like to back or support or get behind? Yeah, firstly, um, come at me on Twitter because I could literally do that all day as a conversation. But the, um, and, and it's the job of, my, of Energy UK to represent the kind of entire energy industry, right? So um, uh, if you want to at me on Twitter for personal views, do. But what I'm about to say reflects the, the kind of industry view of things too. And actually addresses some of the stuff that we've been talking about, right? And, and some of your questions. This is the truth of it. There's no point in an ideological purity test on this stuff either side of the aisle. And I said this at, at Labour Party conference last week. It, it, it naturally, because it's a whole economic shift, will require some interventionist stuff um, in areas of the economy which are hard to shift or where just incentives won't cut it. And there's some stuff where government can get out of the way and not touch it. And, and um, you know, on the, on the left, you hear a conversation about wanting to say nationalise offshore wind when, and I always used to go, why, when it's working? Um, and on, on the right, you hear not wanting to intervene or spend government money on, on some things or being reluctant to kind of tell people what to do in their own homes, even when we can see that there'll be a massive economic payback from doing it. And instead, just looking at, say, carbon pricing. And the answer is it's going to be a blended solution of both. And on the technology side of things, um, the straightforward answer is the stuff that has been successful has been able to compete in the market as it's currently designed. Um, and so at the point in the transition where we're at now, it's pretty clear which the big winners will be. And we've mentioned renewables and pretty much the entire in energy industry, our investors um, and, and our markets are reorientating themselves around the idea that the incumbent will be variable renewable technology and plus stuff that works with it. Now, in the UK, that said, in the UK, we can only do about 70% renewables, maybe 80% renewables before there are some technical barriers and hurdles that we worry about and don't have the answers to yet. And so we, are, we know we're going to need some kind of other technology, nuclear, um, BEX, uh, hydrogen with CCUS on some other thing in the mix. And that's the point about what well, we need to invest for that technology too. Um, with the rest of the economy, it's still up for grabs. So again, because of what we're doing on the power sector, you can see more or less what's going to happen in other areas of the economy. We're going to need lots of heat pumps, some hydrogen boilers. We're going to need um, mostly electric vehicles, perhaps some hydrogen in freight. We're going to need something for aviation and shipping, which is likely to be a biofuel or hydrogen. And we're going to need some negative emissions technologies. And it's pretty straightforward. And the reason some stuff we don't talk about or has gone out of fashion or, or anything else is because they've either lost in the competitive market or we can see how the whole system is going to work together. Um, I really echo what Johnny and others have said. We need to do what we know that we're good at, even and especially when it's boring, like energy efficiency. We need to invest for the technologies of the future because we're hoping to be able to provide global leadership, to do export, to keep the industrial benefits in the UK. And, I, and above all for this conversation, I think we really do need to sort our markets out. And Johnny mentioned this ability for people to really properly capture the value in our energy markets of these new technologies and what they do. We've talked about carbon pricing. We've talked about setting certainty for investors. This is all about just making it easier to pour the money in that we think is there and to maximize the benefits back to the UK of doing it. And I know I've ranted, so I'll just finish on this. I used to hear all the time from government about why we didn't manufacture even more onshore wind technology in the UK than we already do, or even more offshore wind components in the UK than we already do. You know, we have factories in the UK, but they came as a second wave. And when we first did offshore wind, we were importing a lot of the components. And the genuine reason for that is government hesitated about whether to invest in wind when it was very early stage at the stage that BEX is now, or hydrogen is now, or, or heat electrification is now, we, we blinked. And Scandinavia invested instead. Now, we have the cheapest um, energy source in the world in offshore wind and a globally leading market. But if we'd invested early, we'd have also had more of the plant, the manufacturing and the jobs here. Now, that's catching up. 
But if you want it from the very beginning and you want to be the world champion in the technology, you have to be brave and invest immediately as soon as you can see the potential. And, and, and everyone in this conversation has listed like 15 different technologies where that is true. Uh, a viewer named Grace writes in to ask the panel what your take is on Extinction Rebellion and whether or not our panel is sympathetic to their aims and objectives. And I suppose, Will, this kind of gets to the crux of it about swaying hearts and minds because you can bring in all the technology and all the structures, but you have to get people on board too. What do you think is the best way to sway hearts and minds? Oh, that's a very good question and one that I find, um, frankly, at Drax is often quite frustrating. Because um, I think, as all of you probably know, um, Drax, there are many people who don't really agree with what Drax is doing. We spend a lot of time trying to make it clear that what we do, for example, that supports forest is very is helpful to forestry as opposed to the reverse. Um, that what we're trying to do is to kind of reduce carbon emissions, not the reverse. So there's a lot of things that we're trying to do that are um, quite positive. And, but ultimately, I think there's, there's sort of two answers to this question. One is that the, um, you know, there are specific sort of, we, we need to make the facts clear, right? I mean, there is, there are fact-based arguments and we need to make those arguments around, you know, what we do about what others do, about what risks are. Um, so one of the things, for example, I think is really important as we move into a world of carbon capture and storage is make clear that that's been done before, that it is safe and we're sort of clear on that. And, and in a sense, engage with people to make sure they understand it and not sort of dismiss their concerns because there are real issues now. We need to make sure that we are um, aware of those. The other, the other part of it is, that's, that's the minds piece. So the other is we have to engage with people on an, uh, an emotional level too, right? I mean, we are, we're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to solve this problem. I thought it was um, interesting when Andrew suggested that, I, that me and my contemporaries need to be convinced to invest. So I think it's probably as important that other generations are excited about this too. And we need to win, the, we need to win those hearts uh, as well. So uh, it's really both the hearts and minds kind of battle. Yeah. Jonathan, do you think um, ideology uh, in both directions, whether you're Extinction Rebellion on one end or more skeptical of, of climate change on the other end, do you think that extreme ideology is getting in the way of, of moving towards net zero? Um, I don't think it's helping helping things. Um, so for a long time, we, we only had widespread publication of extreme ideology on one side. And now with Extinction Rebellion, um, with their sort of second year of action, you're seeing that on the other side. And what, what needs to be balanced is, you know, Extinction Rebellion done a great job of raising awareness of climate change in the UK, of, you know, putting forward some, some solutions, which some, some say are too, too fast, some say are too, you know, too upending of the world, upending of the economy. Um, but they've also become very polarising. And now there's a, a big trade-off to do between what is an acceptable level of raising awareness and pushing these viewpoints, um, and then how does, you know, turning, turning people off and turning people against you undermine that to some degree. So... While, while they certainly have, have you know, their, fir their first year of action did tie in with other things. It tied in with the school strikes. It tied in with the David Attenborough program on the BBC, both of which um, with, with the Extinction Rebellion protests definitely brought climate change to the top of the news. And um, some things they've done this year have possibly und undermined some of that by being slightly too polarizing. Andrew, you mentioned that um, if, you were, if you were calling the shots at the very top, you would speed things up in terms of um, launching the, the real green agenda to get us to net zero. I mean, never I mean, so presumptive, Kate. You'll get me into all sorts of trouble. That was not what I said, but, but there is <laughs> okay, that's outline, not what you said. I outlined the opportunity. You did. I'm sorry. I thought that was a, a fair summary. You're right. You did outline the opportunity and a good one at that. Um, but, uh, you know, even for those out there who would like to see things move slightly faster to grasp that opportunity, do you think some of the tactics that have been used to raise awareness about climate change over the past few years have been a step too far? Look, uh, <clears throat> I think the good news is, in a way, we've moved beyond that. I mean, you, you, you know, when every parish council, every district, virtually every public organization has declared a climate emergency. The good news in a way is I think we can avoid some of the polarizing parts of the debate and start putting our problem solving hats on. You know, that's the bit that excites me, to be honest. That's the intersection between government policy, um, all of us as a, as a role with roles of communicators, um, but also harnessing, you know, my, my hinterland, the, the power of business to do good. Um, so if we can make that work, if we can stay aligned stay with the journey, bring people with us, expand the base of people. Um, I think we've got all the ingredients for success. This has been a, a very positive and uplifting call. 
So I don't think we need to actually go back to closing down newspapers as if as if this is something that, that anybody's really in the mainstream of opinion not already applying enough energy to. Um, so that, that's that's like let's just move forward. Let's move forward together, but positively and constructively. I, I must say I do wish every conversation about net zero and climate change uh, had the, the the structure and the intellect that has been displayed on uh, today's panel. Um, Emma, are we at risk, however, whilst it, you know, it does seem everybody wants to hit this target, everybody wants to invest uh, and, and, and get to net zero, are we at risk of being slightly dishonest? One of our viewers says, how do we ensure that we're not just offshoring heavy industry? Uh, and there has been a lot of criticism, even around something like the Paris Climate Accord, that actually, if you really dug into it, um, a lot of developed countries are patting themselves on the back for shipping off their carbon emissions elsewhere. When we talk about net zero, do we really mean net zero or, or do we mean actually shipping off some heavy industry? I'm going to like formally take off my Energy UK hat and put on my, I used to be head of the climate change program at WWF hat. So I um, have done some work on international climate change and, and, on, and on carbon budgets and how they work and don't look, they're imperfect, but they, they're what we've got. Uh, and they're particularly what we've got on a ticking clock. And this is this is kind of to your point on the Extinction Rebellion question as well and what they're asking for and the scale of it versus the time allowed. And for me, it's always been, it's always been more sensible to work with the world as it is and try to get it to change rapidly rather than deconstruct it and do and and do it better as we build it, um, try and make it go better. But I don't think we've got the time to really mess about with with extreme ends of anything. And, and on the way that we structure international climate change agreements, they're imperfect because of often diplomatic realities. So we only account for our territorial emissions in the UK and, and globally, because that's how we report right up to the UN. And the reason for that is if we don't do that and you start looking at your consumption footprint, which we should kind of come on to that in a minute, but if you start accounting your consumption footprint as your national responsibility, pretty quickly you can see in a globalised world how you might end up telling India what to do with its factories um, or Bangladesh, where we import a lot of our goods from. So for reasons of national sovereignty, we do our accounting territorially. We do, however, publish our consumption data and the UK government has said that it will start to look at it. So that's interesting. On the consumption point, I think, and it comes back to comms, the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees roughly comes down to individual lifestyle choices. It come, it, and, and to consumption and to doing less, not just better. And I spent a career arguing that we can do this if we just do things better. But the truth is we also need to do fewer things probably. And um, that means flying less and put, for, for people who fly a lot, bearing our diets for people that eat a lot of meat, just doing, doing things so that other people can do them too. It's a really hard conversation to have with the public. But what the climate assembly showed um, is that actually the public have got quite a strong attitude for having some action on individual consumption choices. The measures the climate assembly came back with were frequent flyer levies and banning SUVs. So this is like a really broad demographic of the country that they, they talked to as part of that process. So I thought that was really interesting. And we do need to figure out how we have that conversation too. Um, what I would say though, on, on the point about, you know, is this enough? <sighs> Most of this is about system change, however you view it, market change or, or you know, policy change at the extreme ends. It's all, it's all about change and a lot of that is in the hands of government and industry where the big leaders are. And we have seen that if we get investment right, if we get the framework right, if we get policy right, the change happens far, far, far quicker than we expected. And so my thing these days is can we stop having the ideological row about the right process overall, the right long-term target date, the right overall technology, and just crack on with what we have been told that we have to do right now. The technologies we have available right now, the very, very relatively easy stuff that we could just do tomorrow, because if we get that right, it's likely to go faster than we think. And as we do that, I think everything else becomes possible and we might surprise ourselves. 
Well, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask the panel the same question. Um, please keep your answers short just so we can squeeze it all in. Um, Will, I'll start with you, but the question I want to ask is we spend a lot of time looking towards 2050 now. It is the date in everyone's diary uh, as to when we need to uh, achieve our net zero target, but I'd like to hear from you what you think success would look like by 2025. What can we achieve in the next few years that genuinely gets on the path to a greener planet? Uh, I will be very specific. I mean, the UK government can enable and have in place carbon capture and storage infrastructure and people capturing and storage, delivering both carbon reduction and negative emissions by 2025. That's absolutely in the sort of legislative time frame or the, the regulatory time frame that the government is currently working on. If they do that, that'll be a huge step forward. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so a lot of the stuff in 2025, the decisions are due to be made as soon as possible. Um, so running through a few, so with building, the heat and building strategy is due imminently, hopefully by the end of the year. By 2025, we should hope to see action on gas boilers not being installed in people's houses, for example, or a more ambitious efficiency target. For the power sector, we need to know, you know what we're going to do when all our nuclear power stations close, what we're going to do when the early wind farms and solar, solar farms start to close. Uh, need long-term certainty there. There's an industrial decarbonisation strategy due in the first few months of next year. That should give long-term certainty for industry, what, what it should look like over the next few years. The, so investment decisions start to be made and by 2025 stuff is being built. And then finally for electric vehicles, once we have a, a phase-out date you know, enshrined in law, then we'll start to see more and more of them on the roads. We'll see the infrastructure growing around it and we'll see all the benefits that come out of that. Jonathan, very quickly, that's a very comprehensive list. Do you think that's all achievable by 2025? I mean, on a scale from one to 10, how optimistic are you being? I'd, I'd say it's all very achievable, yeah. In fact, this would be, you know, that's probably quite, quite reserved, really. Could go a lot further, a lot quicker. All right, then, Andrew? I mean, I'd like to see hundreds of thousands of green jobs, uh, incremental green jobs, uh, and jobs where people can tie their own prosperity and that of their family to the progress that we're making in decarbonizing the economy. Um, and that's important because it means we're successfully growing industries, which in turn bec can become exporters, which in turn can allow us to achieve the prosperity we need as a nation. And it's important because it means that we can close that circle um, where, where you do as you start to make some of the choices uh, that came out of the, um, the Citizens Parliament and that Emma talked about, where people can actually see that virtuous cycle, whereby as we go on this journey, as we make some of the potential, I wouldn't say sacrifices, but some of the changes in our own lives, they can also see that we're building prosperity and jobs for the next generation. You know, capitalism in its simplest sense needs that, the deployment of capital to create shared prosperity for us all. Uh, and so we've got to put this, if we're serious about putting this at the heart of a green growth recovery and leveling up as we started to, uh, to talk about at the beginning, then we're going to need people up and down this country and ideally a little bit more up than down, if we're truthful, um, tying their own fortunes and success to the green economy. And I, like others, absolutely think we can do that by 2025. Just a very quick follow up on that, Andrew. One person has written in asking if we should prioritize cities over more rural areas just for the immediate uh, public health benefit in terms of air quality and the rest. We know that city centers are on their knees at the moment because of the COVID-19 crisis as people haven't been going to the office. A lot of service-based industry um, is, is struggling to stay afloat. Do you see these two issues combining in some way to actually create more jobs in the future that can also tackle this issue of city pollution? Absolutely. And uh, I don't think we've probably got enough time, Kate, today uh, to go through what we need to do to our cities, because we need to reinvent our cities and make our cities green and sustainable, but most of all, make them fantastic live work spaces. Uh, and some of our cities, most of our cities, um, aren't that today. And we see right now empty trains shuttling through the countryside devoid of people. Um, if you look at some of the reason why continental European cities have found it so much easier to persuade people to return to the workspace, it's because it's a short ride or a cycle uh, or a, 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 you know, a walk. Um, so we've got, we've got a much, you know, another topic for another spectator panel on another day. But how do we revitalize, reimagine uh, the city in a sustainable future? 
Um, and it's, it's a great opportunity. It's a win-win. It's a win for people's quality of life, for the environment, for decarbonizing. Uh, and again, within that holds the seeds of our future prosperity. Well, thrilled to have you already committed to another spectator panel, spectator panel, Andrew. That's fantastic. Um, Emma, what is uh, what, what does a good 2025 look like for you? All right, I think this is more or less the same as Johnny's list, but let's give it a go. Um, government can um, invest in infrastructure and network stuff, so things like EV charging or um, the networks, whether that's gas or electricity, that we're going to plug all this technology on. Um, that's something that they can show real leadership on. Building retrofit, dear God, yes, I feel like we've been asking for that for years, and energy efficiency is resource cost negative to the economy. We just need to make people's homes better places for them to live and start on heat decarbonisation. Um, the government could start designing energy markets that actually reflect the energy system we have and will definitely have by 2025. They can allow more competition for investment. They can allow the retailers to actually make some money so that they can invest. And we can kind of enable some of these new services that Johnny was talking about by allowing people to access markets and do really clever things. Um, we can sort our industrial and export policy out so that we can make sure that the jobs we create in the UK can be useful as other countries decarbonize. And we can invest in some of the infrastructure like um, roads for access or, or keys for large boats that we need for the next wave of renewables development. And we can support um, next generation technologies, whether that's, you mentioned SMRs earlier, but you know, BEC, CCS, all of the stuff that we have not got down the cost curve yet, that we need to, to do the same thing with, as we did for offshore wind. And lastly, to start where I finished, we do not value things properly in the economy when we're having this conversation. So if you wanted a silver bullet that overnight would transform how we think about this stuff, a net zero test across the entire economy and across our policy making would be transformative and, and the carbon price um, for how the markets function. Well, no small task that we have to achieve in the next five years, uh, let alone by 2050, but a wonderful start, I think, today on our panel. Jonathan, Will, Andrew, and Emma, thank you so much for joining me. I'm sorry we can't thank you in the usual way, but I'm sure that our audiences at home are applauding. Uh, if you are watching on from your office or your home, thank you so much for tuning in. Much more to come on Spectator TV today for the Spectators Alternative Conference tomorrow and Wednesday as well. So keep tuning in and we'll see you at the next panel. Thank you all.